Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video, or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's case is going to be sort of a follow-up on a case that I covered a couple of weeks ago or a month ago at this point, and that is the tragic death of Grant Solomon and the abuse of Gracie Solomon. I had the wonderful opportunity to work with a representative of the family who has sent me even more information about the case than what I was able to find on their website, and let me tell you, if you weren't already convinced that Grant's death was more than just a tragic accident, then buckle up because there's more. There's a lot more. So today, given this new information, I am going to focus more on the death of Grant Solomon and all of the circumstances surrounding that. But before we get too far into the video, I wanted to go ahead and give you a happy update on this case, and that is that Gracie is now safe and living with her mother, Angie. I was literally so happy to hear this news, but she is still in danger because there is an appeal coming up, so we still need to fight for Gracie and make sure that she can stay with her mother where she belongs. Keep signing, keep donating, and keep doing what you can to support Gracie. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's video. So today we will be discussing the tragic death of Grant Solomon and filling in some of the gaps that may have been missed and answering some of the questions that you may all have been left with after the first video I made on this case. In the first video, we discussed the timeline, how Angie met Aaron and the allegations of abuse towards both Grant and his sister Gracie. We talked about how various members of the church, the children's school, and the local government all ignored the reports of abuse that both Gracie and Grant were making for years, about the inconsistencies at the crime scene after Grant's death, and we pondered how the entire scenario was reported versus how it may have actually gone down. In this video, I'm going to dive further into how this investigation was handled from the police side of things, how they handled or mishandled the scene, and how they came to the conclusion that this was just an accident. Also, I want to give a special shout out to the podcast Crime Solvers. The Crime Solvers podcast has two hosts, one of which is a former journalist and the other is a retired police officer from Boston. They go over different cases from a police perspective, which I always appreciate because that is a very important perspective that we just don't get to hear very often. So, if you want to hear even more about this case, make sure you go ahead and listen to their episode titled Southern Injustice, The Suspicious Death of Grant Solomon. But with all of that being said, let's get into the video and I want to start with a quick reminder of what happened to Grant Solomon. On the morning of Monday, July 20th, 2020, 18-year-old Grant had left his home in Franklin, Tennessee at around 7.37 a.m. to drive his 2015 Toyota Tacoma pickup truck the 50 miles to the Ward Performance Center in Gallatin, Tennessee, arriving between 8.30 and 8.40 a.m. It's a hot day this day, around 90 degrees that day. Then, per Aaron's reporting, he was also at the Ward Performance Center that morning, and he was on his phone checking his work emails in his own car when he looked over and saw that Grant's truck was no longer parked next to him. He said that he then looked over and watched as the truck struck Grant and then dragged him the 60 feet across the parking lot before landing in the ditch and trapping Grant under the truck where he ultimately died. That is what Aaron was claiming. But a lot of people just are not buying what Aaron has to sell. A lot of people think that this was not an accident at all, but a murder. In the last video, we talked a lot about the scene of the incident, how the grass of the ditch looks unbothered, how there was absolutely no sign on the pavement that Grant had hit the asphalt and was dragged how there are no marks on Grant's body to show that he was burned by his hot truck after being trapped under the truck that he had just driven for about an hour. He had no burn marks from being dragged, no scratches, no scuffs, no nothing. But there are also a lot of inconsistencies with how the scene was investigated as a whole, and that is what we will be discussing now. So first, with the story that Aaron told about what he was doing when Grant was hit. He claimed that he was in his own car checking his work emails when the truck had struck Grant. Police would be able to confirm or deny this story just by checking the digital forensics and seeing if he did access his emails when he said he did, 
but police never checked that. They didn't check his emails, his text messages, or the calls on his phone to see if he actually was on his phone when he said he was. Then we have the 911 call. If you watched the first video on this case, you probably heard that 911 call that Aaron made after Grant was pinned under the truck. So, so, so many commenters, again, just could not believe what they were hearing, and I definitely see why. I have had parents who have children of their own comment. I had people who don't have children, but even thought about the situation with their pets. I had law enforcement give their thoughts, and every single person agreed that Aaron just did not sound concerned whatsoever. He couldn't even pretend to care in that 911 call. Then on the Crime Solvers podcast, the host talks about how he has taken thousands of 911 calls, many of which are crying, hysterical, upset, and anxious because their loved one was harmed in some way. He agrees that he is just not convinced at all at Aaron's tone of voice. He does not sound like a man who just witnessed his son being hit by a truck and pinned under not at all. I will be playing that 911 call for those of you who have not heard it yet, but if you did hear it in the previous video, go ahead and skip forward about two minutes. I'm trying. Where's your emergency? There, it's 1357 South Water Street. It's off 109. Please hurry. You said 57? Please hurry. Okay, what's 1357. going on? Uh, my my son's truck backed over him, and he it's rolled over him and dragged him into the ditch, and it's on top of him. He's trapped under the truck, and I, I yeah, he, I, he I, somehow it drug him underneath it. Yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to no, I'm I'm trying to call nine one one. Okay, what's your name? Oh my God, my name is Aaron Solomon. And you said oh my God. 1357 Southwater Avenue, right? Yes. How old yes. is the male? He's 18. He just turned 18 a couple weeks, about a month ago. It's my son. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is not good. Is he awake? And oh, please hurry. You? I don't know. I don't think so. He's not, uh, he's not alert, right? No, he's out. And he's trapped. I got three guys here and he's trapped under the truck. Okay. Oh my God. I understand, sir. Stay on the phone with me while we get somebody out there. What's your name? Aaron Solomon. All right, Aaron. Huh? What kind of vehicle is it? It's a Toyota Tacoma, Tacoma and it's the, the vehicle has to, he's underneath the vehicle. Okay, I've got and the, that. And, and it's... Okay, I've got that. What color is it? It's a white truck. That's my son. He, it, somehow it backed up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on one. On, I'm on with nine one one right now. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Was your son working on it? No, no, he was just getting out of it. It's the hill. It's we're on an incline, and I guess he didn't have it in park or something, or it wasn't engaged, or oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe still not responding. No, no. And he's still under no. truck. No one can get yes. out from under it. No, it's no. We saw it's, units and route to you. I'm just asking you questions for we can huh? update them, okay? Can you check and see huh? he's breathing? I, I, somebody's telling me that he's coming too. Okay, maybe. He is, he is waking up, maybe. Kind, of, kind of keeping still. So he is. Well, he breathing. can't. Yeah, he can't move. I don't think he can move. I, I don't know. Okay, I no, he can't move. He's trapped. Okay, well, we got somebody in route. Now, when he wakes uh, up, he might I'm be telling scared. Him, then somebody I'm get down him. there and talk to him. Yeah, somebody talk to him. There. Shit. Gee, there's blood. What, is he facing up or down? He's facing up. They said he may aspirate. We need to hurry. Oh, my God. So, does he have blood coming out of his mouth? Yeah, he's, yeah there's blood coming out. 
Yeah, somehow it drug him down, I think. I don't know whether it wasn't in park or what, or if it didn't engage the brake, or it drug him underneath somehow. Okay. They said he's facing up. Okay. But he's bleeding from his mouth. So, Grant, turn your face to the side if you can, barely, but be careful. Don't move him, okay? No, we can't move him. We can't, we can't move him. All right, these and they're there. I'm gonna let you go, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Uh huh. Bye bye. The podcast also brought up another great point. In the call, Aaron mentions that there are three other people with him, three other men. Yet, when police arrive to the scene just four minutes later, the three men are gone. Now, with most situations, when someone, especially a child or a young person, is harmed in a way like this, whether they're hit by a car or some sort of other accident, people are rushing over to help that person. I've literally seen videos of men going on each other's shoulders or using each other as human ladders to save a kitten from a tree. Parents also will risk their lives by running into burning buildings or freezing cold ice water to save their child. It's literally just instinct. I'm not even a parent and I know that I would risk my life to save my dog if she were in grave danger. You don't have to be a great upstanding person to do that. It's literally just instinct. So, if there are three other people there, four grown men including Aaron, Chances are, if this was just this tragic accident, that they would all be working together to try to lift that truck off of this young man and doing whatever else they could to try to save him. Yet, apparently, nobody did anything. If there were three men there, then this means that these three men literally saw Grant getting run over by the car and then ran away from the scene so quick and so far that police did not see them within the four minutes that they got there. Not one witness apparently offered to help Grant. Instead, they just left. It does not make sense whatsoever. And again, we know that the entire 911 call, Aaron is just standing at the top of the hill, looking down at Grant, not going over to him, not trying to offer help, not doing absolutely anything to help his son who is trapped under his truck. Again, we've all heard those stories of women, small, frail women, mustering up the strength to lift up a person or lift up a car or something when someone is in grave danger. People just instinctually do these things. They have adrenaline rushing and they can do things that they never thought that they could do when someone else's life is in danger because that's just how humans should be and that's how most humans are. Now, with the 911 call, one thing that I have seen brought up that if you want to support Aaron and, you know, having no concern in this 911 call is that Aaron is or was a news reporter. Maybe he's just really good at staying calm and reporting on things like this. But I do want to remind you all that, first of all, he is a sports reporter. You aren't really talking too much about horrible, tragic life or death situations all that often. And beyond that, no matter what your job is, you are still a parent if you're a parent. I have listened to the Crime Weekly podcast with Stephanie Harlow and Derek Lavasser from time to time because, again, I love hearing the police perspective on these cases. And Derek himself has said that time and time again, even though he's dealing with very insanely stressful situations on a regular basis where even his own life is in danger when he's at work, when there is something involving his own child being injured or at risk for harm, he does not act how he acts at work because, again, your parental instincts kick in and you act like a parent. Not like a reporter, not like a detective. You act like a parent. You might be extremely good at staying calm and collected in most situations, especially if you have a very high-stress job, but a lot of times when it involves your own child, again, those instincts kick in and you start acting crazy because your child is in danger. But if you're not concerned about your child because you are the reason that they are in danger, 
then maybe you won't act all that concerned. Either way, after the 911 call, police arrived to the scene and they took down Aaron's statement. On this day, Aaron told the police that Grant had grabbed his baseball gear, including his gym bag and his baseball glove from the bed of his truck. And so when he was in the back of the truck getting his stuff, that is when it started rolling back and trapped him under. However, in a later statement, Aaron told the police that Grant had actually had his gym bag and his glove in the driver's side back seat of the truck, so that is where he went to grab them. That may not seem like the biggest inconsistency to some, but it is. Why? Because if that's true, it makes no sense that he was hit by the back of the truck and rolled over if he was actually standing on the side of the truck when it started rolling. Because again, if you're standing on the side of your truck, getting your stuff out, and you notice it starts rolling, you're not going to run to the back of the truck to either try to stop it or to be hit by it. You're probably going to run around the front and try to get into the driver's seat to try to slam on the brakes or move it forward or something like that. You're not going to run to the back of the truck so that it hits you. Then to go further with this inconsistency is that Angie stated that Grant never kept his baseball gear in the open bed of his truck. Now, Grant was described as an amazing baseball player. He was hardworking, motivated, and those who played with him said that he would never let any challenge or difficulty stand in his way. So, that being said, those who have played similar sports say that there is no way that Grant would have left his baseball gear in the open bed of the truck to be exposed to sunlight, rain, humidity, snow, etc. That would ruin your gear. Then, leaving them out like that, that leaves them susceptible to being stolen. Then, once again, Angie said that he always kept his gear in the back seat of the cab of the truck. So, there isn't even a belief here that he would have even gone to the back of the truck to begin with. He would have been on the side. So, there's that. But, let's say for the sake of argument that he did decide to put his gear in the back of his truck on that day for whatever reason, and he did end up going behind his truck to get his gear. The story here is that he was hit, then he was dragged 60 feet across the asphalt, grass, and rocky surface before the truck dropped backwards into a ditch filled with mostly grass and rocks. At this point, Grant is trapped under the weight of his 4,000-pound Toyota Tacoma. Some people questioned on the last video if maybe the car was accidentally put into neutral and that is how it rolled. But nope. When police found the car, it was actually in park. So once again, now the story that you have to believe is that the car had some sort of transmission issue to the point that it started rolling back while it was in park. This was a 2015 Toyota Tacoma and the year was 2020, so it was only five years old, not new, but not old. And the car itself has a five-star safety rating, and as far as I know, there haven't been any other instances reported of a Tacoma rolling or moving after it is placed in park. Then, beyond that, I mentioned in the last video that an independent forensic examination was done on the car, but I wasn't exactly sure of the findings. Turned out that one of the findings in this examination was that this car, this specific car, was not defective. There were no transmission issues, nothing to say that it was defective in any way. So how did it roll if it were placed into park? Then let's discuss a little bit further into his injuries again. As we discussed in the first video, he barely had any injuries to indicate that he had been dragged over 60 feet. No road rash, no scratches, no torn clothing, no nothing. Upon examination at the hospital, he only had three lacerations to the back of his head, then three bruises, one on his jaw, his hip, and his thigh. His cause of death was ruled as a result of blunt force trauma and cardiac arrest. To get even deeper into that, I mentioned that his body allegedly rotated 180 degrees while being dragged. So, he was hit with the back of his head facing the road when he fell, so he would have fallen in the direction of the road. So if this is the building, this is the road, he would have fallen this way. Then as the paramedics arrived, he was actually facing the building. So apparently his body rotated 180 degrees under that truck. In the last video, I talked about just how unlikely this was, how he was six foot three inches tall. He's 
pretty tall and I just didn't think that someone that big would have turned like that under the car. But some people argue that it's possible, so I will say that if he did rotate like that for the sake of argument, you would see that his clothes also would have been dragged with his body. His shirt would have been pulled up. His pants would have been torn at some point. His arms would have been in awkward positions as he's dragging across the ground. I don't think that if he turned 180 that he would have just been in like a, you know, the yoga pose, the corpse position. I don't think he would have just been flat laying and turned like that perfectly. There would have been moments where he's, you know, rolling onto his arm and being dragged that way and then, you know, rolling back onto his back and, you know, hitting the back of his head and then his shirt being pulled up and his pants being torn and his shoes maybe falling off and things like that. He would have been moving around a lot if, again, we are to believe that his body turned 180. It's not just going to be a perfect, smooth transition where he rolled and nothing got scraped and nothing got scratched and he didn't touch the bottom of the car and he didn't touch the surface of the concrete. That wouldn't have happened. So if he did move around like that, if we are to believe that he turned 180 degrees as the truck was dragging him, you would expect road rash and scratches and scrapes at least to the back of his arms and his back. But that was not present. Then, as I stated before, he drove about 45 to 50 minutes to practice that day. The podcast talked about different aspects of car things that I just don't know about, so I'm really glad that I heard that. So, they talked about how after you drive that far, your catalytic converter, the muffler, and your engine block area on the bottom of your truck will be around 200 degrees. Then, Outside, it was about 90 degrees out, so sometimes if it's really cold, the car can cool down a lot faster, but if it's really hot like that, by the time he got there, the car would not have cooled down by the time that Aaron reports this incident happening because, as it's been reported, he parked and then within minutes, that's when he was under that truck. The temperature required to burn your body is around 160 degrees. So, by the time Grant was under that truck, rolling around, probably touching the bottom of the truck and all that, the truck still would have been between 160 and 200 degrees. So, chances are, he absolutely would have and should have at some point have some sort of burns and you would have seen burn marks on his body or at least cinch marks on his clothes. But there wasn't anything like that. In addition, he was also wearing a gold necklace that was not damaged or broken off in any sort of way. He was still wearing it around his neck. His shoes were also in perfect condition, no scrapes, no scuffs, or anything on them either. Then, when looking at his phone, there is a puncture mark right in the middle of the phone. If the phone had been damaged by being rolled over by a tire, which is what is being claimed, then the shattering pattern would have been more diffuse all over the screen, not in a little puncture placed perfectly in the middle of the screen. The story here is that Grant was probably holding his phone at the time that he was hit because it wasn't found in the car, it wasn't in his pocket, or anything like that. So, if it wasn't found in the car, it wasn't found in his pocket, then he must have been holding it when he was hit. So, the question here is that if Grant was holding his phone at the time that he was hit, First of all, the phone probably would have been in the parking lot if it flew out of his hand when he was originally hit, but it was found in the ditch. So, again, for this sake, if it had been run over and dragged with Grant, the damage would have been more diffuse from, again, being struck on the ground, from it being run over, from it falling and, you know, hitting the ground in all sorts of different directions. But again, there's only that one little puncture mark to the screen and no damage to the back of that phone. So how did that happen? Did somebody smash the phone with a rock? Was it thrown and landed on a rock? Because I can tell you, it sure as heck was not rolled over. So now let's get into the police response to this death. As a whole, this case was looked at, his injuries were taken down at the hospital, but Aaron filled out paperwork that denied having an autopsy done without consulting Angie whatsoever. Then, police ruled that this scene was an accident in less than one hour after being at the scene. So, Aaron called 911 at around 8.44 a.m. that morning. 
Within four minutes, by 8.48, the paramedics and officers arrived. By 9.41 a.m., the last officer leaves the scene. So, within 57 minutes, police here felt that they did a thorough investigation, left the scene, and ruled it as an accident. So, during that 57 minutes, officers and paramedics arrived to the scene within four minutes of the call, which is a very good response time. During that time, their first priority, of course, is to lend help to the victim, which was Grant. They got the car jacked up, they got his body pulled out from underneath, attempted life-saving measures, which was CPR, then got him into an ambulance and sent him to the hospital. They questioned Aaron, got his story, and apparently looked at the scene to see if it matched up. Then they left. All of that within one hour. And they're trying to tell you that they did a thorough investigation. Now I want to pause about this aspect and talk about the ambulance ride and Grant's time at the hospital. According to a report from a private investigator hired by the family, as Grant was in the ambulance, he actually appeared to be getting better. He appeared that his life may actually be saved. He arrived to the hospital with a blood pressure of 86 over 50, which is very low, but I've definitely seen a lot lower. My blood pressure is around 90 over 60, so that's not too much higher than 86 over 50. And his pulse ox was 85, which again is low, but it's not life-threatening immediately, and it's not the lowest that I've ever seen in a patient that is perfectly fine. However, once his father arrived to the hospital and, you know, saw Grant and all of that, there was no blood work taken, there was no defibrillator done, there were no body scans, no x-rays, no ECGs done, and no ventilator to keep Grant alive at least for long enough for his mother and sister to get there who were 45 minutes away and were headed in that direction. All of those things were denied. In literally any other case, you would see all of those things happen, especially in a young man who is so very clearly healthy before this happened. You would see any and all life measures being taken to save this life. But Aaron showed up at the hospital and all of a sudden, these things were not done. Witnesses at the hospital also report that Aaron did not shed a tear at the hospital. And in the weeks after, including at Grant's funeral, Aaron showed no signs of grief. Now, yes, everybody grieves differently. We can't necessarily judge someone based on how they choose to show their emotions or not show their emotions publicly. But when your son is dying from a horrible, horrible accident, any parent, any parent, no matter how much of a deadbeat you are, any parent will ask for any and all measures to be taken for their child to survive, even if it's only for another few hours as the mom and sister are coming. Any decent person would want the mother of the child and the sibling to at least be able to say goodbye to their loved one, but that is not what happened here. Now, let's go back to the scene before Grant was taken to the ambulance and focus on the police side of this. Police talked to Aaron for a few minutes and got his story. At that point, they are most likely treating Aaron like a father who just witnessed something horrible and tragic happen to his son. He is a reporter once again, so he has to be pretty articulate and well-spoken. And somehow, apparently, he just has this way about him of convincing everybody around him of whatever it is that he is saying. So, it seems that police just took his word for what happened, and I will talk more about this in just a minute. After this, there was hardly any coverage of the situation on the local news, hardly any mention of anything other than saying that there was an accident involving a young man. Nothing else. That was it. So, what did police do to come to that conclusion? Well, not a ton. So, people might say that, you know, this is considered a small town, that maybe they don't have the resources or the manpower or the training to properly investigate, but that isn't true either. Gallatin, Tennessee has a population of around 46,000 people. According to the Crime Solvers podcast, they should have around 50 to 70 patrol officers. They have seven members of the command staff, which have a chief, a deputy chief, and five captains. They have one member with a law degree, a few with master's degree, and a certified crime analyst. They also have a fatal accident reconstruction investigator on their department. So, 
they should be able to have the resources and the training to know when suspicion is warranted in a case and how to properly investigate a scene. According to what was said on the Crime Solvers podcast and just honestly general intuition of somebody who knows anything about crime, you should never take the word for a sole witness of a situation where someone is killed. As we talk about in so many other videos that we've covered, we always say the phrase, they were the last person to see the victim alive, so they were investigated whether they were ruled out or not, they were investigated. But in this case, that isn't what happened. The last person to see the deceased alive was just believed. Then, in addition to the Gallatin Police Department, the Tennessee Highway Patrol actually has many accident investigators who investigate over a thousand fatal accidents in Tennessee per year. Typically, when there is a fatality involved, they want to do what they can to investigate the scene to make sure that there's nothing else going on here. So, they know what they're doing with these cases. But again, nobody investigated this one. So, now going back to what investigators did at the scene and after. At the scene, again, they spoke with Aaron, who again, they wanted to be a little bit more sensitive towards in the very beginning, and that is totally understandable. They wanted to be polite and kind to a man who, to them, just witnessed his son dying in a horrible accident. Again, he is very well-spoken, very articulate, and apparently very convincing. But no matter how convincing and polite and well-spoken someone is, as a police officer, you need to stay objective and really think about what that person is telling you, what they may not be telling you, whether they could have a motive for wanting to cover up something or lie about something, etc. Because after this, police should have secured the scene. They should have spent several hours at the scene to investigate the situation and see if it matches the story and all of that. They should have called over the accident investigator to fully reconstruct the scene and investigate the situation to see if the story that they were told is accurate. They should have ordered an autopsy for Grant's body and not left it up to the one person who was the sole witness to this incident. Then, after the scene, after a few hours, or even after, you know, 72 hours, after a day or two, police should have gotten back into contact with Aaron to talk to him more about the scene. He is a person of interest. He should be considered a person of interest automatically because he was the very last person to see his son alive and the sole witness to a situation where somebody lost their life. At that point, after some time has passed, they should have asked him more grilling questions. They should have dug deeper into his background, his story, and Grant, but they didn't. Then let's revisit the information from the scene. We talked a lot about this in the last video, but I found out even more after this new information was provided to me. As we know, much of the scene does not add up to the story that is being told. Again, we discussed this a lot in the last video, but there's even more to talk about right now that I did not mention in the original video. So first of all, as we all know, there are no tire marks going from where the truck was parked across the asphalt to where it landed in the ditch. As we stated before, the grass that you see at the front of the ditch closest to the parking lot looks unbothered. I now know that it had not rained for at least a week before this incident. So, with how dry and brittle you would expect the grass to be, you should have seen some breakage and some tire marks that had pushed the grass down if it had rolled back into that ditch. The grass should have been bent down and slanted in a direction that faces towards the bottom of the ditch, so facing towards the south direction. So if this is the grass, this is where the truck was found, and this is the building, you'd expect that the grass would be slanted this way after the tires had driven over it. Instead, they saw tire marks that go in the direction as if someone had driven forward into that ditch in the opposite direction. There is grass back behind the tires of the car that show that the grass is slanted towards the building or in the north direction that show that the grass was driven over forward, not backwards. Then we find out that there is a milk carton by the tire that was not rolled over. It was in front of the tire. So, if it had been rolled over backwards from the parking lot, then the milk carton would have been crushed, the cap would have been popped off. But it wasn't. 
So that shows that the car may have been driven forward and stopped before it crushed the milk carton. Then of course, we have to talk about the damage or lack thereof to the truck after it had been in that ditch. So again, as we know from before, there was almost no damage to that truck. The bottom of the truck was completely undamaged. There were no scrapes or dents or any sort of other damage to any part of the bottom of that truck. There are large rocks in that ditch, and if we're to believe that the truck rolled all the way back and then went into that ditch with such force that it went up the opposite side of that ditch, you would see some sort of damage caused from those large rocks. Then I also found out that there were actually two spare tires in the open bed of the truck as well as personal items in the cab of the truck. If this truck rolled back and again went up the opposite side of that ditch, you would see things moving around all over the place. You would see the tires bouncing around, rolling, hitting the sides of the truck, maybe even bouncing out of the bed of the truck, but you don't see that. Everything in that car looks unbothered and unmoved. So that says to me that the truck did not stop with such force required to create this scene as Aaron described it. Then sort of the last thing about this truck itself is that it was found with the front wheels turned at a 90 degree angle. That would have made it impossible for the truck to roll down that hill backwards. Then, as we stated in the previous video, Grant's glasses were found on the sidewalk next to where the truck was found. Then, on the driver's side front door in that ditch was a bloody rock. So, to me, that says that Grant was not hit in that parking lot because, again, if he had been bleeding from blunt force, which he was when his body was found, you'd see that at least, at the very least, there would be little blotches of blood on that pavement where he was allegedly ran over. You'd see that his glasses would have fallen off and they probably would have still been on the parking lot on that asphalt because again, if he was hit on the asphalt, that's where his glasses probably would have fallen off. And again, you'd probably see some sort of sign of him being hit on that asphalt like blood or something like that. But again, you don't see any of that. So to me, knowing all of this information, the theory here is that either Grant was hit with the car while he was standing on the sidewalk and the car drove directly into that ditch forward. Or after looking even deeper into this evidence, I think it's also possible that Grant was assaulted and possibly killed either on that sidewalk or in that ditch and he fell, and then maybe the car was driven over him to stage the scene. Because if you think about it, if the car was driven into that ditch without much force, that would explain why things didn't move around much in the cab or the bed of the truck. That would explain why there were no real damages to the truck. I will mention that the only damage that was to the truck was the back bumper, and in the previous video, we did talk about how that could have been caused by the jack that was used to lift up the truck. So that would make sense for why there was almost no damage to the truck whatsoever. It would also make sense for why Grant would have a bruise on his jaw if he were hit in the face and then blunt force trauma to the back of his head if he was either pushed and hit that rock on his head where he ultimately bled or if someone picked up that rock and hit him with it and then threw it into the ditch, or if he was hit in the head some other way and he fell back onto that rock and that's where he bled, that would explain how he got the bruises, the blunt force trauma, and why there was blood on that rock. Then we know that after the event took place, the car was allowed to go back to Aaron's house. It was said that witnesses saw Aaron driving around in Grant's car the literal day after his death. Then, as we discussed in the first video, the car, which again was not badly damaged, was taken to the junkyard to be totaled. Somehow, one insurance agent was convinced that the car was so damaged that it warranted it being totaled and smashed. Yet, we saw pictures of it. It was not damaged. This is how it looked sitting in Aaron's driveway after the incident. And apparently, even Aaron didn't think it was that badly damaged because he was seen driving around in the truck. So why did he take it to the junkyard to be totaled? As we know, it was only after Angie found out about the car being sent to the junkyard that she was able to finally get a hold of it and send it in for private forensic examination. So, 
that could have been why he wanted it to be totaled if he didn't want anybody else looking into what really happened in that car that would make sense but that's all I'll say allegedly everything here allegedly so of course with all of that being said we still need a motive why would a father want to harm his own child. If you watched the first video I made on this case, probably the first half hour of the video was putting together the timeline of the events leading to this situation. The abuse claims that Grant and Gracie made against Aaron. The multiple, multiple times that Gracie had allegedly been sexually assaulted and raped throughout her life. How Aaron allegedly starved and humiliated Grant how he allegedly showed up to every practice and game to watch Grant and make sure that he was constantly practicing at home and proving that he's an amazing athlete, how allegedly Aaron only saw Grant as an extension of his own good parenting and how he wanted him to be the perfect athlete, how he painted this picture of Angie allegedly and made her look crazy, saying that she tried killing herself even though he was the one who allegedly strangled her, even though all she wanted to do was protect her own children. How Aaron had good standing with those at the church that he attended, which was connected to Gracie and Grant's school, as well as with the local government who all attended church with him, including the governor, Bill Lee. They all attend church together. We know about the multiple medical professionals who reported and testified about the abuse that Aaron allegedly put his children through, who all said that Angie is a perfectly fit parent who is perfectly capable and ready to take care of her children. How throughout their entire lives, Gracie and Grant begged the court to let them be with their mom, but year after year after year after year, after telling multiple other trusted adults, after telling CPS agents after telling people at their school, people at their church, people in the courts about the abuse, they were continually denied. They were not believed. They were either placed into CPS care or the care of their father. But now, after all those years, after all of these things happening, why now kill Grant? Well, the day he died was only two weeks after his 18th birthday. We talked about how it was possible, we kind of pondered, that maybe Grant felt that once he turned 18, there was more that he could do to convince the courts that Aaron was allegedly abusive and that Gracie should be with her mother and all of that once he was legally an adult. Because again, the kids testified so, 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 so many times about the abuse, but they were never believed. Grant begged the judges at the court, the DCS workers that he worked with, and law enforcement for protection from his father but no one listened. It was also stated that when Grant was in the legal care of a family friend, this family friend also reported Aaron for abuse after hearing about it from Grant and Gracie, but apparently this case was filtered out of DCS within 30 minutes. Grant expressed fear. Grant expressed fear towards his father because he had anger and rage issues, and Grant said that he was afraid that his father was going to harm him. But, I recently found out that there is actually evidence that this was the case. It's not just something that they're wondering. There is actually evidence to say that this may have been what was going on. Just after Grant's death, a friend of Grant's made a statement saying that just six months before his 18th birthday, him and the friend were talking. Then something about Gracie got brought up. That is when he told the friend that he witnessed numerous incidents of abuse towards Gracie at the hands of Aaron, yet whenever he testified to this at the courts, he was never believed. The friend reported that Grant had every intention of not only reporting Aaron for the abuse against Gracie, but also reporting on suspicious and illegal activity that he found on his computer, all once he turned 18. Again, in the previous video, we talked about how there were allegations that Aaron was grooming underage girls at Grace Christian Academy, that he had sexually assaulted other young girls and things like that. So, he said that he wanted to report on all of these things and that maybe once he turns 18, the courts will finally believe him. The friend left that conversation saying that he had no doubt in his mind that Grant was planning on testifying against his father once he was a legal adult. Then I found out that on the morning of the incident, Grant knew that he was meeting up with his father at baseball practice. As he was walking out of the door that morning, he asked his mother if she was going to be around that day. His mother said yes, and according to the report, Grant said, I don't want to die in Gallatin today. 
At this point, Grant had not seen his father in a while because he was placed into the care of a family friend through DCS. So, he was afraid to go to practice on this day because he knew that his father was going to be there. Why was he so afraid of his father at that point? Again, he had not seen him in a couple of weeks. He was now 18 and he was now seeing his father. You put those pieces together. So, with all of that being said, we know that police got the ball and absolutely blundered it. They failed miserably. In my opinion, I think that they met Aaron at the scene and he was just so convincing and police just took his word for it. Maybe it was because they knew him due to his role as a news anchor or maybe he's just that charismatic and charming enough that they just believed him. I don't know. But whatever the case was, police did not bother to look for even a second to see if the story checks out. Through everything that they had to do from EMTs getting to Grant, police talking to Aaron, talking to EMTs, all of that, there's no way that within that same amount of time that police did any sort of investigation into the scene before leaving. They were there for less than an hour. They cannot even try to claim that they tried to do a thorough investigation because of the fact that on record, they simply were not there very long at all. Objectively, there's no way you can do a thorough investigation in that little amount of time. We're not even saying that the investigation was an hour long. We're saying that it probably was honestly half of that. They probably only looked at the scene for less than a half hour because the first half was spent trying to save Grant and talking to Aaron and all of that. So they didn't even spend an hour on the investigation. They spent less than an hour at the scene in general and probably less than half of that on actually assessing the scene. Then they didn't bother to question Aaron at any point after that day. He was never considered a person of interest because police never considered the possibility that this was more than an accident. They didn't do any sort of forensic examination on the car. They didn't do any examination at the scene. They didn't do a reconstruction of how this situation took place. They didn't question how a car placed into park could have rolled like that. And they didn't do an autopsy on Grant's body to see if it matched the story. They didn't even seem to follow up with the hospital staff who were telling them their injuries and they didn't question any of the injuries that he had. They didn't question that all of his clothes, that his shoes, that his necklace were all in perfect condition. They didn't question any of that. They did not do anything that you would expect in a scene that involves the death of a young man in suspicious circumstances. If police looked into Aaron, they would have seen that he has had multiple abuse allegations made against him. They would have seen, even if they didn't believe the accusations, let's say they knew about them and they didn't believe them, at least, at the very least, that he had been at multiple custody hearings with his ex-wife and son. Even if you didn't believe a single accusation, you would still see that he has at least had trouble with his ex-wife at some point, and that alone should warrant some sort of suspicion and an investigation, again, let alone the long-standing history and allegations of domestic abuse. But okay, Let's say for the sake of argument, to be fair, in the initial stages of the investigation, let's say that Gallantin police really did believe Aaron. They did believe that there was no reason for further investigation. Sure, if no one, me included, the family included, if nobody else had ever looked further into this case, then maybe it's reasonable why they never thought that they had a reason to reopen an investigation because again, they didn't look into it. They didn't think anything was suspicious. No one brought forward anything, so they never reopened it. But again, that's not what happened. Multiple people, including private investigators and other forensic experts, have looked at the scene and the car and have blatantly said that it does not add up. It does not make sense. This isn't a situation where people are reaching, trying to say like, hey, here's this one little thing that looks a little bit out of place. Let's look into it and, you know, reopen things. It's not a case of a mother who can't accept that her son has died. It's not a case of a family who are just grieving and just cannot accept it. There are blatant things to this scene that do not add up. Multiple other witnesses came out to talk about how Grant was afraid of his father and uncomfortable and afraid of seeing him on that specific day. Multiple people have come out to say that Grant planned on testifying against his dad once he was 18. Family and loved ones have all reached out to law enforcement, wrote letters to the governor. I read this letter where it spells out, everything that police missed. They've done everything that they could possibly do in their power to tell authorities that there is not only just speculation, that there's not only just suspicion, but concrete proof that this was not just an accident. 
Yet even with all of that, the mountains and mountains and mountains of information, the police will not reopen the case. They will not do anything. And that is what gets to me. How many people does it take for the police to do something? How much evidence does it take to convince authorities that this was not an accident? How many witnesses does it take for the authorities to believe that these children were, and Gracie still is, terrified of their father? What does it take? I am so, so, so very impressed with the traction that the first video has gotten on this case. At the time of this recording, we're at just over 300,000 views, almost 3,000 comments, 11,600 signatures, $9,000 raised for Gracie, and $4,700 raised for Grant. Let's keep up that energy and keep this case going. Let's keep fighting for Gracie and Grant. Let's keep letting Gallatin police know how much Gracie and Grant mean to us. I will not stop making videos. I will not stop talking about this. I will not stop sharing their stories until something is done. And I hope you all keep that same energy. Keep signing, keep sharing these videos and their website, keep donating, keep doing what you can to make people know, make people pissed, make those responsible finally take accountability for what they did to these two children. I will put down the relevant emails and resources in the description box of this video. Any emails that I do share below, feel free to email them and let them know how you feel. Make those who are doing nothing know that they need to be doing something. Please check out those resources. I will have a list of emails for you guys to reach out to. I will have other resources that you can use. I, of course, will have the petition anywhere that you can donate. There are, I believe, two GoFundMes and I believe a Venmo that you can donate to to help with the investigation. Any way that you can help, please, please do so. So that is all I have for the video, but that is not where I am done talking about this case. Within the next few weeks, I will be making another video to discuss the people involved in the cover-up aspect of this case, the specific names of everyone who Angie reached out to and what proof that we have that they ignored the cries for help because every single person who is involved in covering up the alleged abuse, there are receipts and I will be sharing them with you all. I don't exactly know when that video will be made because there's a lot of information to go over. There was a lot of information to go over with just this aspect of the case, but I want to be as thorough as possible. I want to be as accurate as possible. I want to understand this case so deeply so that when I talk to you guys and I show everyone the evidence and I show you the receipts and I talk about each person involved that you firmly understand what exactly is going on, why they were ignored, what they did to ignore the family, and everything else that goes into this whole thing. There's so, so much more to this case, and I really hope, again, that you guys keep up this energy, this amazing energy of sharing this story and doing what we can to finally bring justice to those who need it. So again, make sure you keep your eyes peeled for that next video. It'll be coming out within the next weeks or maybe a month or two, again, just after I feel like I have all of the information that I need to accurately and thoroughly cover that part of this case. But that is where I am going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos, especially the next video that I make on this case. Make sure you go ahead and check out the resources that I have listed down below. Email anybody who you feel needs to be reached out to. Let them know. Let them hear you. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Usually, I keep up with a lot of these cases on Twitter, but for this case in specific, I've been sharing a lot on my Instagram story because I've been in communication with the Freedom for Gracie Instagram account. So, make sure you go ahead and follow my Instagram and their Instagram to keep up to date on this case. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. And with that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.